everybody. Welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 573, being recorded on January 29, 2020. 2020. 2020. I'm Sebastian Peake. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. And I'm Josh Walrath. So, uh, welcome back. This is the official podcast of PC Perspective, if you have stumbled upon this, PCPer.com on the internet. And uh, we do this every week, usually on Wednesday nights around this time, 10 Eastern. But let's just get right into it, because we have a, a list of news and reviews this week. Just one review, actually, to get to first from Corsair. I don't know if you saw this at CES, Corsair, of course, well-known uh long you know they've been making computer components for a very long time they've made computer memory they got into other things and they're pretty much synonymous at this point with liquid coolers all in one liquid coolers and at so, at some point about a decade ago i had forgotten about this but in around 2010 we were talking about the last of their air cooler line. They had this air series, and I think the A70 was the last of these. Kind of looked like a Hyper 212 style cooler back then. And they are back in a big way with a very large cooler. This is a dual fan. It's not technically a dual tower cooler like we're used to seeing from this larger cooler category, but internally it is, really. Um, we'll talk about that. But some unique features about this, the the most unique of which, of course, is the way the fans mount on this thing. By the way, I'm talking about the A500 dual fan CPU air cooler. And the fans, as you can see from the graphic, if you're watching the video or if you look at the review, they are on these sliding mechanisms. They call it a ratcheting fan mount. But essentially, the, the fans can slide on instead of having to clip them on with metal clips or something. Just slide right on from the top, and then you can position them anywhere you want. So they can be as high as you want or as low as you want, depending on how tall your memory is and that sort of thing. So the install process for this cooler, which is a combination of the slide-on fans, uh, a top cap that just pops right off, uh, and I'm holding one here and I have the, the top removed. So there's this nice trim piece that you can take off the top. And when it is removed, you're looking at what is pretty close to a dual tower design, because you can see right through the middle here. And that's where you have access to the mounting screws. So with a lot of these coolers, like with the Noctua D14, D15, you've got to take the center fan out to get to the two mounting screws, because the mounting mechanism of this is pretty much identical to a Noctua. If you look at the base of it, um, You've got your, your heat pipes through here, but then you have this bracket that's pre-attached. This is set up out of the box with these uh, side brackets. And it also comes out of the box with pre-applied pre thermal compounds. So it's very, very easy to get it installed. And if you've done a knock to a cooler or you know some of the recent uh, similar large air coolers, this is gonna be identical. The mounting process, the, the usual like metal back plate, four posts, get the bracket installed. This screws down with two spring-loaded screws. And the fans are PWM fans. It comes with two 120 millimeter ML series fans. These go up to 2,400 RPM. So right off the bat, if you've looked at any larger coolers, you've seen RPMs that range somewhere between 900 and 1,200, usually maybe up to 1,400 or 1,600. So 2,400 is very high. And I expected this to produce a little bit more noise as a result. So when I did the testing, I tested it with just the standard motherboard fan profile, as I did with the other coolers I retested for this review, on a Core i9-9900KS. And I have been, I have taken some slight grief over the last year or so because I never updated the CPU cooler test bench. I just didn't have time. And the thought of retesting a bunch of old coolers was not particularly exciting. But I went ahead and retested uh, three other coolers for this review. The NHD14 that I have on hand, I don't have a D15 here, sorry. Uh, and the Be Quiet Dark Rock Pro 4. And then I grabbed the Hyper 212 RGB Black Edition just to give you more of a budget option. That's in the $40, $45 category. But this cooler, out of the box, 
exactly the same performance as the Noctua NHG 14. And by exactly, I mean, I thought I did something wrong and I retested it again. And the chart looks like it's just an error because the two have exactly the same idle and exactly the same load temperatures to the 10th of a degree. And that is the, they weren't exactly the same. It's just, that's how they actually um, came out when I factored in, because these are Delta temps when I factored in the, the current ambient room temperature, because I'm very fancy and I actually record the exact current in, interior temperature to the 10th of a degree Celsius whenever I take a temperature measurement. However accurate this uh, indoor thermometer I have is, that's how accurate these results are. So anyway, exactly the same performance as an NHD 14, which is really, really good. If this is their return to air cooling after a decade, and they have managed to tie one of the most legendary large air coolers of all time. That is fantastic. The Dark Rock Pro 4 edged it out by about a degree under the longer blender workload that I gave it for a load test. And I think part of that, not only does the, the Dark Rock Pro 4 have an interesting, um, we've talked about this sort of dimpled uh, surface. So there's a little bit more cooling capability from the fins but it also has a really high pressure mount. I think it has the highest pressure mounting mechanism of any company other than maybe Scythe. They're probably tied. Uh, so anyhow, uh, the, the noise was going to be the big determining factor. Okay, it can tie a D14 with thermal performance. What about noise? These fans were spinning at 2,400 RPM under load. And that's where it got pretty loud. Out of the box, if you don't change any fan profiles... I measured a high of 48.4 decibels, which is almost the same noise output as the reference Radeon RX 5700 series, lower cooler from AMD, which was, I think, 48.6 when I tested it. So different noise character entirely. It's not a whine like a blower cooler, but it sounds like an aftermarket GPU cooler. It's very, it's a lot of of fan air noise. So I did some extra testing and I tested it at 50, 60, and 70% fans, manually setting the fan profile. And noise from, I, I could have gone all out. I just didn't have time. I wasn't going to do 80 and 90. You can kind of see the difference. When you go from 70, uh, go down to 70%, uh, thermals were not impacted very much at all. And the noise went down by almost eight decibels. So we're at the, the 40 to 41 range. And then you drop down to 60%. Suddenly you're at 37.4 decibels was the high. And then it went all the way down to 34.5 dB at 50% fans. 50% fans, you were like four degrees warmer, but you can make some trade-offs with this by customizing your fan profiles. This does not come with any low noise adapters or anything like older Noctua fans did because it has RPM fan or PWM fans. So you can adjust the RPMs in software. Um, I was a little surprised though. This is a Corsair product. I've been conditioned at this point that Corsair means IQ. So this does not have any RGB lighting. It has no IQ integration. There's no USB, anything coming out of it anywhere. It's, it's just a CPU cooler, which, you know, it's, it's just like a, a massive to me. block of metal with two fans. And you say massive, hey, if you guess how much this weighs. You- I know, I know I'm an incredibly strong person. I'm making this look 310 like grams. No, it's it's a little bit higher than that. Oh, oh come on. Nothing's pounds, it's, uh, oh, no, it is. Just it, because we're mostly American. Sorry, Jeremy. In pounds and ounces, how much do you think this, this little package I'm holding weighs? I, I know it in grams, too. We can do grams. Well, I mean, that's what the specs are. After all, by the way, this makes incredible podcasting to to wait. It, well, you it does. The it's it's that you can't see. scintillating. Oh, OK, so Jim is ruining it. Fourteen hundred and sixty grams, which equates to about three point two pounds. One point five kilograms. That's yeah, that's a yeah. lot. That's ludicrous. This is heavy. Now, some of the remember when you would have been terrified from... to put that on a CPU. Like that yeah, much weight that, on a CPU would be what are you insane? That's it's dead now. You're gonna break the motherboard. Yes. As a prop, I actually have the mounting mechanism here in my hand. And if you look oh, at does it, it ever it's, look like Noctua's. 
Oh, very much. And it's it's all metal. So this is once this is this is on the back of the motherboard. If you have an Intel setup, uh, AMD are using the one that came with your board. But then the bracket goes on top. It comes with separate brackets for uh, the different uh, fan mounts, the different CPU socket mounts, I should say. But you know, this is it. It's it's strong enough that I didn't feel like this was going to break my motherboard. But it is the heaviest CPU cooler I've ever used. And a lot of that is because, and I should have shown this before. This mechanism on the side to raise and lower the fans, there's actually some resistance there. It's not super easy, but the fans are on the are on a pretty big plastic um, frame, yeah. and you can swap your own fans. Just standard 120 millimeter fans, but the cooler itself has these metal tracks on both sides, and there are these two like metal bands that create pressure against the frame when it's sliding up and down. That's what holds it in place. So you have infinite adjustability with the fan positions, but it adds weight. All this stuff adds weight. If you were to take both fans off, you're looking at a heat sink that with a little bit of plastic remove would be a pretty standard, you know, larger heat sink. But, you know, I wonder I even know, I, cramp down much as, you know, they, they recommend, you know, how much actual deflection that will have against a cpu because i mean it's it's a significant amount of weight and yeah you're you're clamped down still pretty good but you're not like you know 75 pounds of of, of torque on on well no you know a couple of lug nuts that's going to hold it flat no matter what was there any yeah, at all did you do i did not I, I need to come up with a way to test that I feel like if if ratings.com started testing CPU air coolers, this is exactly what they do because they I don't know if you know who they Here, are, but here's a good idea. Yeah. Um yeah, you know one of those uh those plastic gauges that uh when you're working on engines and you know it's 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 uh how what, what is what the called? pressure of it is. Well yeah, I can't what name of it? No, it's it's, it's uh, I can't remember what it's not strain gauge or something like that. But anyway, no, it's it's, it's a little piece of plastic that uses automotive things where, you know, you you put it in there and you clamp it down and then you undo it and then you measure it. And it would be interesting to see the difference between you know with that same piece up top as as the bottom, and see uh see if there's any kind of even a little bit of deflection in there. That if you oh, use a smart phone for this, like just put your. Put your phone in there and then like clamp down until the <laughs> cracks. You're like, well, Gorilla Glass Five takes this much pressure yeah. to crack. Hmm. Uh, anyway, but it's it's the same. It's almost the same weight as my Threadripper cooler, like my Noctua 14 millimeter that's modded for the TR3. It's a serious amount of cooling. Actually, yeah, I was just thinking wow. the closest thing here is that. Uh, it's actually bigger than that Cooler Master Cooler they released for Threadripper initially that AMD sent out with those, and I cannot remember the name of it. That huge thing. Yeah, it's bigger than Maury's buddy. It's is it is it's it bigger huge. than a Red Fox? Could you put a bagel yeah. in there? You could put. I think you could put two no, bagels toast. in there. In fact, if you modified it right now, you can only put half of one bagel in it. The slot would not accept a full bagel. Okay, now but I, I think that would have a negative effect on the cooling. But it would have Here's a positive effect how long will on how toasted my bagel was. Bagel to toast. Yes. Yeah. We have to test Get it. it in there. I, I admit that I did not test this as thoroughly as I could. I could have done bread toasting versus toaster strudel. Um, so bagel waffles. marks could be, could, could be like the new, new big thing in, in air cooling. Nice. Yeah. Anyway, check out the review if you want to see more of the results and pictures. I didn't mention the fact this is a direct Last contact. gauge. Which is oh plastic gauge. Thank you, you plastic gauge. Hey, that could be incorporated in the next review. As I said on Twitter, come for the photography, stay for the fan mounts. Check out the A five hundred review on PC and Try our bagels. And try That's our so bagels, funny which that I, I should yeah, have I'm posted in there. A computer that has an A fifty running in it. Still, really? You have the A fifty all these years. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a really good cooler for the time. Mm -hmm. And it's still is a very solid same cooler. fans too yeah it hasn't uh hasn't blown up at I'm all impressed so i'm impressed yeah See, they don't yeah. make fans like they used to well and by that i no. mean they don't make them like they used to used to where every sleeve bearing piece of crap fan from like 1991 doesn't work without a horrible amount of noise anymore uh hey let's talk about earnings 
earnings. Uh, something that I don't do enough of. Five dollars. I don't earn. Yeah. And then I gave it to my dentist. I didn't win that lottery. I will admit, I did not sit in on either AMD or Intel earnings calls. Now, the Intel one, Jeremy reported on this back on the 24th, and then we just got AMD earnings in the last day or two, right? Was that yesterday? Yesterday. Yep. So, let's see. Intel's earnings were huge. Were huge. And they were surprising. There's the classic Scrooge McDuck. Yes. Yeah, Intel made 20 point two billion dollars it's it's a record for them and uh there's interesting things because one they've got competition from amd two they're they're supply constrained on their processors and three nobody expects intel not to make a profit and four no we're not going to go there but there there are there are interesting numbers in there because twenty point two is is a quarterly record for them. They've they've never gone that high, and I I can't remember. Uh, look in there and see what their their net income is. It's it's many multiple billions of dollars, and so yeah, I mean they're they're supply constrained in the Xeon, except the Xeon market is growing. The server market and data is growing faster than pretty much anybody expected. Even the CPU side um, of the the consumer side is growing at like 1% to 2% for Intel. And again, nobody really expected that. I mean, they're expecting, hey, you know, AMD may be taking some market share away. And, you know, the death of the PC and the the, the mobile market and that is, is, is well nigh, which, of course, it isn't and hasn't been for the past 15 years that, that everybody's been saying that. But... You know, we, we, we kind of can look at the numbers and say, you know, and AMD is probably profiting well, and we'll find out later that they do, but that Intel is selling everything they can make, and they're making some pretty good margins on everything. I mean, it's nearly, what is, uh, what gap? Uh, it's, it's nearly 60%, and they're running at 58.8% margins, which is high, but it's not as high as other previous years. Um, I think part of that is they, they are seeing more competition, even though they're still shipping a lot of products. They still have a very clear advantage in mobile for now um, with their latest uh, you know two or three generations of, of chips that is uh, servicing that area. And something that AMD with... The 3000 series, while the 3000 mobile series were good, Intel still was significantly better across the board in, in pretty much every metric. Um, that may be coming to an end. We'll find out and do that testing soon. Uh, but yeah, uh, there's kind of interesting discussion about why the data centers are exploding like they are. And one of the other areas that has not been really talked about uh, by Intel is how much of this is actual demand versus mitigation and and replacement of older Xeons that have a lot of these. Um, um, come on. What's that word I'm trying to think of? Intel provides mitigations against vulnerabilities. Kyle, oh, is it really that hard? Was that you can't you read my mind. So on a lot of the mitigations... Anyway, a lot of their mitigations, the previous parts, have all cut down performance dramatically. Whether it's, hey, you know what, we're you, you can't do multi-threading on a lot of these older parts, or we do uh, different different uh, type BIOS and microcode changes that, you know, where we can't be aggressive on, um, you know, prefetch or, uh, you know, some of these look ahead uh, and stuff that you know, like Row Hammer would have, and 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 boy, I'm just on a roll tonight, but essentially they're, these companies are trying to get back performance. They're, they're trying to stop the vulnerabilities in their products. And so they're buying a lot more of the new stuff, which has some of these fixes in place. Um, and brand new. Issues and so too. that's, that's kind of what, when you, when you think about, you know, their, their, uh, SSD, their, their NAND, um, their X cross, what is that stuff? 
3 D X point. X cross. Yeah, X point. X point. Okay. Why do I even have a job anymore? I can't remember a damn thing. You just need to <sighs> refresh, reset. I maybe yourself. need a vacation badly. Did you install yeah, some spectre you know, mitigations into your brain? Are they, I is it think so. You know? It uh, it reduces the effectiveness of your brain, but it makes it safer. <sighs> You can't That's get in trouble probably, for things that you don't say. Yeah, this is true. Uh, but yeah, all these things kind of have come together, and they've given Intel a very tremendous quarter. Now, the downsides is they're still not shipping a lot of 10 nanometer. They have said that the second half of the year is when we will see a lot more 10 nanometer products, but they weren't willing to give a lot of flavor to these kind of um, declarations about what that actually entails. <laughs> um, as, as we've talked with Charlie, things still look grim and 10 nanometer. And uh, they kind of skirted some of the more pointed questions that uh, people made of uh, Intel about the 10 nanometer. But they're not going to really start ramping that up to the second half. And it's not going to be ramped up, it looks like that good uh 2020 maybe now 2021 maybe 10 nanometer plus which will fix a few problems <laughs> but really they're not going to be having a truly effective well they hope an effective process to uh, note until seven nanometer hits which would be 2022 maybe late 2021 if mm. if they can pull that mm. in you're being nice. Yeah, maybe. it's yeah, it's iffy, but you know, AMD has has a huge window of opportunity here. <clears throat> hey, and speaking of AMD, let's smoothly transition to their earnings, Josh. Because obviously, if Intel is up, that AMD cannot possibly be up, right? Well, yeah, because you know, obviously, uh, people were expecting AMD to take market share, and uh, Intel showed that they had an incredibly strong quarter. And sure enough, AMD really probably didn't take all that much market share, especially in enterprise. But they matched the increases of the industry's demands, and so they had a two point one three billion dollar quarter, which is a record high for AMD. Their entire existence. Uh, they came close to it, I think, in 2004, 2006. I can't remember which which year. But uh, this is the highest quarter they've ever had. And it is primarily the strength of Ryzen CPUs and the introduction of the new Navi um, RDNA architecture for GPUs. Those two products, uh, I think, in their consumer group, plus uh, a significant growth in, in mobile, even with the 3000 series, which, again... Not great as compared to what Intel has, but a huge step forward for AMD. Uh, I think it was about 1.6 billion uh, just from that alone. Uh, their enterprise and semi-custom uh, was another 4.69 billion or somewhere around there. It was a little bit down from where expectations were. And they say primarily that is due to uh, lower um, royalties from the Xbox and, and the PS4 and some of their other semi-custom work. And that's to be expected because those products are going to be um, refreshed next year. Uh, first quarter, we'll not see very much money coming from Microsoft and Sony to AMD, but Q2, uh, you will start to see it. And they think that things will really max out around Q3 uh, when it'll have a, a positive, uh, a very positive effect on, on the bottom line. Now, how they do the royalties for this is, is kind of interesting. I think there's, there's development. A lot of the development is in the front end. And when they kind of consider part shift, which of course, AMD does not ship any of these console chips. What they do is they design it, they sign it off. They, they give the design to Sony and uh, Microsoft. They then choose, uh, well, I mean, they've already chosen their uh, foundry partner and they make the way for orders and they pay for that directly. And then they give AMD money in, in terms of royalties. And so, you know, a longer the product goes that they don't do any kind of development work on, but if it sells well, then their royalties are all coming in. But 
the the front end is so loaded on AMD's side that when you kind of look at over the I know this is a long wandering meandering thing, but this is apparently how it works and what I've been told. But um, the overall margins for these products, as you know, a kind of per APU, if you want to call it, shipped uh, is lower overall, just because many factors. Um, including what they've, you know, uh, um, worked out with Microsoft and Sony and their individual contracts. Um, but the longer it goes, the more it's kind of just free money. And so if you sell a lot of them, you'll have a negative effect on AMD's margins, the way they do the accounting, but it's still more money. Do you see how that kind of works? Anyway, regardless. And I wouldn't say irregardless because irregardless. That would be wrong. It's not a real world. Yeah, Correct. Uh, but regardless, uh, the enterprise uh, with their Epic processors has grown, but it has not reached double digits yet. AMD is is not telling how much it is. There are some people who say that you know their server market share is as low as four percent, and that seems really kind of low. I would be more in the seven to eight percent that they're sitting at right now, and they're hoping to grow that to the double di- double digits in the first half of of twenty twenty, and from all indications and with Intel's continue continued supply constraints because they're using 14 nanometer for pretty much every Xeon, um, AMD is going to be able to eat away that market share and ship products because they've got, you know, tons and tons and lots of orders of the very, very small Ryzen uh, chiplets that go into these Epic processors. And, you know, it was... Yeah, AMD could have had a better year, but they really either underestimated how much demand there would be, or they simply could not order enough wafer, wafers at seven nanometer. Now, even Lisa has said supply of these seven nanometer wafers are still tight, but it is improving. And now, you know, we we finally see the thirty nine hundred X and the thirty nine fifty X. And really good supply, which is something I honestly was not expecting three months ago from from AMD. I thought that the 3950X would be a very limited addition part with only availability coming in, you know, closer to the introduction of, of Zen 3 because, you know, people would stop buying the Ryzen 9s and, and wait for the next generation. But instead... Um, Right after Christmas, these things started showing up in in mass. And so AMD does not seem to be having the supply issues that uh, they were. And they had a a very, very good quarter. Now, next quarter, they're expecting a a seasonal drop, which always happens. uh, But they're expecting about a $1.8 billion plus or minus $50 million uh, revenue, which, again, is historically very, very good for AMD. Um, I know quite a few years ago, they were just praying that they get to $1.5 billion, and that would be more of a, a break-even type uh, a quarter. But still, in, in the slowest quarter of the year, they're achieving what looks to be about a $1.8 million billion and still improving on their uh, epic growth and uh, continuing to be strong in retail. And, uh, you know, we can talk more about, uh, you know, AMD in retail, which has been shockingly um, strong for them. And even though retail is only a small part of the market, it's kind of an interesting bellwether as well as, you know, it's good margins for the company. It's it may be a small part of the market, but it's the only part we care about. It's the only one we really can cover. Yeah. Yeah, it's the stuff we can actually go out and buy or people can go out and buy that we can review. Well, I mean, we can always hope that uh, someone can convince Cisco to start putting AMD chips back in their appliances. Hey, there's a thought. It used to be there. Okay, so last week we talked about the 5600 XT, the new Radeon graphics card, which is basically a slightly cut down 5700 non-XT. And then, of course... Along with that release came the BIOS update, the vBIOS update that happened bef- just before the re- reviews were due to go live. So people were scrambling to retest cards after flashing them. I was smart and had held off on most testing until the very last minute because I was expecting a driver update, which is what they did the last two launches to me. But 
there was no driver update. There was a VBIOS update. And of course, if, if you don't remember, that involves not just a pretty big clock speed increase. We're talking GPU clock bump of like 190 megahertz, almost 200 megahertz. Uh, also, memory was bumped from 12 gigabit per second to 14 gigabit per second. So how is this possible? Were there just 14 gigabit per second chips on there and they had it artificially tuned down for product segmentation? I was just guessing when I released the review about that aspect of it. Um, I guess I could have, you know, looked at the memory chips and looked up what their actual speed rating was. Anyhow, uh, MSI, who does this rather revealing live stream every week, uh, the MSI Insider Show, uh, they they talked in depth about, I remember when X570 was announced and they actually pre-announced some motherboards kind of by accident on that stream back <laughs> then and talked about the active cooling and how they were all going to have active cooling and it wasn't ideal, but that's the way it is. Here, MSI was very upfront about what was going on. I think it starts around the, I want to say maybe the 13 minute mark or something. Uh, somewhere in there. I had this memorized. Not last all week. cards yeah, can do 14 gigabits. Right. So that's the big news. And uh, like videocards.com has a, a write up on this based on this video and some other outlets reported on this. And the problem is that like MSI, for example, they say they, they didn't buy their own memory chips. They were getting the memory from AMD along with the GPU. So when they were putting together their boards, they don't have necessarily the stuff that's rated for 14 gigabit per second. So it's up to you if you want to flash it. It's overclocking the memory at that point, and they don't necessarily want to support it. So there are plenty of cards out there in the wild, by the way. I actually heard from XFX, XFX today. Uh, they sent a, us a 5600 XT. I have it in the box. And... They pre-flashed it before they sent it for review. It actually showed up a little bit after the launch. But a lot of the cards that are out there in the wild don't have the BIOS update yet. So it's just kind of, it's all over the place with this launch. And AM, or, uh, Asus and MSI apparently are two launch partners who are getting, well, according to this report anyway, we're getting memory straight from AMD and are using 12 gigabit per second memory and not everything is necessarily going to be able to go up to 14, according to MSI anyway. So that, it's interesting. Uh, Videocards.com goes on to do some like inside baseball stuff about like reviewers being told to, you know, update the, bio, the BIOS regardless and, uh, you know, basically changing the product because that's that's really the, the difference between some of these products is what their core clock speeds are and so like a, a gaming x becomes a gaming z in the lineup if you do the bios flash which is you know ask someone like jeremy who's done a bios flash in the past where you basically take the next card up bios flash it on your card and you've unlocked higher clock speeds even if you More can't beautiful. actually unlock yeah i mean maybe you don't you're not it lasted unfusing. for about a year. Oh, did it? No. <laughs> it died. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty decent. See, and this and this is what MSI is worried about because you can overclock anything. You can overclock a GPU. I over I always ran my GPUs overclocked twenty four seven. I only kept them for about six months, sold them to the next person, and moved on. But uh, who knows how long it would have lasted if I'd used it for like a year or two in my case. But. There's concern well, about the so case. Kind of the... I think it was more the blower style cooler. It just doesn't add to the longevity of cards. Yeah, and plus, you know, this it's a more recent trend to buy these overbuilt, ready to overclock GPUs. It seems like yeah. everybody has half their lineup is ready to overclock on a custom PCB with beefy power delivery and stuff. But no, I mean, with this launch, it just seems like the reviewers absolutely had to use the new V BIOS. That's what AMD was telling them to do. And it, you didn't want to be the outlet who had the review of, well, here's this lackluster performance. Um, also, footnote, a new VBIOS came out a day before the review was set to go live. And I haven't had time to retest it yet, which completely changes the story because it doesn't add anything to the cost and it raises the performance by 10%. So there was, it's a no-win situation for these companies like MSI who, it's pretty funny to watch the video because... These are people who are like 
<sighs> okay, here's the mess we're in. And here's why not all the cards are going to be able to hit these numbers. And, you know, it's just, that's just the way it is. So there's these specific models that we shipped that can do it, that we're going to support. And the rest of them, it's basically like you're on your own, which it, I don't, they didn't, I don't think they came out and said you're voiding your warranty by flashing it. If they have a BIOS, like a V BIOS update available, then that's something that I think you can safely do. But who knows if a month out of warranty, the card's still going to work. They're, that's what they're protecting. They're protecting, they were worried about higher than normal RMAs for these cards, essentially. So that sucks. Uh, I don't know if we need to say anything else about that, but it's just the the review numbers that are out there are not necessarily indicative of the performance of every card that you can go out and buy. I was looking on Newegg, and a bunch of the cards are still listed at 12 gigabit per second memory. I don't think they're going to change those, and the ones in the Newegg warehouse are not flashed. So you're going to get a card, and it's going to be whether or not you can find an update for it, and if you want to risk it for 10% greater performance. So do you think uh, MSI and, and these partners were all herbated? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I want to say... Scott Herkelman. Uh, yeah, I won't comment on that, Herk, but I will Herk, say... Herk. MSI seems a little more irked than some other companies with AMG in general, I would put them as the sort of the J's two cents of uh, manufacturers as far as their relationship with AMD right now. They're still a partner, obviously. They're still releasing stuff. But, you know, J rather infamously didn't get sampled the new Threadripper and Ryzen 3950X along with us. I mean, we're, we weren't the only ones that didn't get it at launch, but he seems to always have big issues with AMD stuff when it launches. And he's, you know, very public about it because he has a, personality driven youtube channel and so he's kind of you know upfront about things he's having issues with i know th with this launch he did get a 5600 xt but i was kind of putting my head in my hands because he talks about at one point in his review that after the vbios update his fans didn't work anymore on the card and that it was reporting some crazy number like 36,000 rpms and they weren't spinning, which is the exact issue you will have if you update the vBIOS and don't do a totally clean driver install. And this happened to me with the last launch. I want to say it was the 5700 launch. I had a Pulse card from Sapphire, updated the vBIOS, started getting these crazy RPM numbers reported, but the fans wouldn't spin. It was either X effects or sapphire i can't remember but the guy at, was like oh no, no no you've got to like uh do a clean install or totally remove the drivers i'm like well i'll just run ddu yeah. like, drive, display driver run installer so i did that even though i'm like well i'm on current driver but yeah i should have clean installed the driver anyway so you run ddu and then you reinstall the driver and suddenly it's picking up the actual fan rpms mm -hmm. and the fan curves work properly so in his review Jay said he had to manually run the fans at a certain percentage or the card would burn up. And I'm just like, come on, you've got a DDU that driver, but he doesn't apparently know that yet. Anyway, just stuff like that. And like he had a dead motherboard at X570 launch. So did I, we got an MSI board actually. And it wasn't MSI's fault. It was literally a resistor that was not correct with their initial board design, but the retail boards were fine. But AMD already had stockpiled the pre-release boards. So AMD sent it to me, not MSI. So I got this awesome like MSI X570 godlike motherboard, which has like a $699 retail. And it didn't work at all. Hey, I remember watching so, that stream. Yep. Yeah, I live streamed. I my swore, I to get swore. It to the reason why it didn't work mm -hmm. was because you dropped it. Good job. <laughs> that, that had nothing to do with it. The the broken PCB corner, I'm sure, did not affect it at all. No. But anyway, enough on this. Yeah, tangent. that's us and our swanky <laughs> review models that you know are totally different yeah. from the retail. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that one was. That was <laughs> that actually was. But then I had, I ended up getting a retail one as a replacement. So that's what I ended I used for like the last Ryzen review. So Back to Intel and their problems are not over. If you've, you know, Josh alluded to this, 
the speculative execution vulnerability problem that they've had since what the middle of last year i think june is when we first started hearing about mm -hmm. whatever the last one we had zombie load I think was the last one. I can't remember. oh yeah it's been a while the, the, the spectral yeah. or specter what uh yeah specter, specter and meltdown. Oh, specter and meltdown that was meltdown that was a year ago wasn't it yeah. that oh, was yeah. it was more than a year many ago. years ago Many Roll years hammers ago? before that, okay. but slightly different. Okay. Yeah, don't you remember? Then, then uh, some Intel adjacent site uh, created that AMD exploits yep. page as uh, uh, the Israeli firm. Yeah, yeah, that that was again. That was like two to three years ago. Where have you been? Well, I In wasn't denial. editor in chief until a little over a year ago, so I literally didn't pay attention to anything outside of my little world of cases and coolers I'm sorry so gotcha anyway uh, okay. uh, within the last year or so there have been some issues with speculative execution vulnerabilities and there's a new one this is being cleverly called cash out it was actually discovered here right here in my home state university of michigan uh, researchers were the first to identify this apparently but it's it's being called a medium severity it was given a severity rank uh uh, was it 6.5 on the severity scale? And it, uh, I'll just read Intel's explanation of this first because they have a page up. They they worked with Intel on this, so there could be day one uh, it's patches, I guess, available for this, though I have not actually seen a new microcode update yet. But, uh, quote, on some processors under certain microarchitectural conditions, data from the most recently evicted modified L1 data cache, which they're calling L1D, line may be propagated into an unused, invalid, L1D fill buffer and other exciting things. Uh, this is not quoting them. I'm just ad-libbing here. But it's, it's extremely technical. The concerning part of this, if you read from the cash out website cashoutattack.com where the researchers have, have put stuff up together it was university of michigan and uh i think adelaide worked on this together but they they talk about unlike previous issues they show in their work quote how an attacker can exploit the cpu's caching mechanisms to select what data to leak as opposed to waiting for the data to be available Finally, we empirically demonstrate that cash out can violate nearly every hardware based security domain, leaking data from the OS kernel, co resident virtual machines, and even SGX enclaves. End quote. Isn't that reassuring? Virtual uh, course, machines. They... Yeah. <laughs> now, Intel yeah. stresses that this is something that they think can only be done within like laboratory conditions and and such because this was obviously this was something that was researchers have have discovered this and is not necessarily in the wild but it's still concerning and new microcode updates will of course be forthcoming i'm sure the the list of affected processors remains the same the l1d eviction sampling list i think is pretty much the same as all of the processors since last summer but I'm going back to my Q6600, I, damn it. <laughs> yeah, apparently, uh, Sandy Bridge is still fine. So we can all go back to that. I got to get my 2600 back. Um, but anyway, good to know. Uh, the CVE 2020 0549, aka L1D eviction sampling, aka cash out, which you know, once you read all the technical stuff, cash out sounds a little bit easier. All right. Are you sure it's not that parts. that strange little girl cash me outside? How about that? Cash out? I thought it was more of a James cash Brown out. thing. Cash out. Cash me outside. Anyway. You know, I'm only familiar oh, with there you uh, go. There, Jim James Brown within appearance. the context. <laughs> hey, that's not fair. Uh, it's perfect. I'm, I, the only James Brown I know is Eddie Murphy is James Brown in the hot tub. Hot tub. Got to get some of that hot tub. I, here's something I did not know. I did not know uh, that. Charlie Murphy was finished. much better about James Brown, though. Yeah, well, his stories were great. Yeah. Charlie talks more than Eddie does. Uh, I just finished this 
massive SNL retrospective of like the first 40 years. And so I ended up, of course, as always happens when I listen to an audiobook about something, I'm going on YouTube and watching video clips throughout. So I, I of tune the driving cat. Well, anything, anything that they mentioned on the show, historically significant, I was watching videos. So I, one thing I didn't know, Eddie Murphy only did the hot tub sketch one time. Yeah. It's this yeah. sort of legendary thing. He did it once. A lot of these famous he sketches did were done once or three twice. times. Yeah. Very few times. The way they do it yeah. now is they get a character that's, that catches on. They'll do it like 20 times yeah. before the cast member finally leaves. Uh, back to computer hardware. They talk, related they news. talk about Shatner's Star Trek get a life thing. No, it's not. Oh, Let's see, but you know, I rewatched so that, that today. And again, sorry, I'm going on, on that's a totally fine. different direction, but hey, you know, we're, listen hey, we're a to him talk. driven podcast, Josh. It's okay. Yeah. yeah well, his well, branch is off. He, he was still pretty coherent. <laughs> and now I'm going to get blocked by him on Twitter. He doesn't listen to our show, or if maybe he does. Yeah, maybe, Bill. If you're watching, may I call you, Bill? If you watch, we'd love to have you on. Yeah, I'd like to know uh, your perspective on things in 2020. And we're happy to, you know, accept those CPAP commercials that you do as advertising as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it helps people breathe, and sometimes that can make all the difference. That might make EVGA a difference in my life. I yeah. Anyway. Do you use a CPAP machine? I do not yet. No, I, but... I don't. Maybe I should, the way my brain is working, or rather not. EVGA. You know them as the company that makes NVIDIA graphics cards. No, you know them as the company that makes the really, really cool blacked out motherboards that have no RGB lighting on them. They make cases. The ones that don't do they make dual laptops. processors anymore. Well, yeah, they used to, but yes, they don't anymore. Because I don't think Intel really supports dual processor desktop. I don't think anything does. No. But hey, they have a new core. They, they have a new and improved mechanical keyboard. Can you tell us about it, Jeremy? Well, I mean, we, we saw the Z10 come out a uh, better part of a year ago. And uh, the RGB fans were up in arms because it was strictly R. It had a red back weight on it, but the, the, the greens and the blues were missing. So EVGA decided that it might be worth revisiting that and adding in some fancy new colors to, uh, you know, a fairly solid design that they didn't overly change. Uh, so they still stuck with the kale uh, switches as they did with the original one. Uh, the same rough layout and design. The fact that it ships with a, a nice rest pad or wrist pad. But they've added a couple of interesting things. Like they've upgraded uh, that little LED at the top, not just the quality, although somebody who bought it and mentioned in the comments, the, the, the field of view on it is quite poor, but well, frankly, I mean, what angle are you looking at your keyboard from, dude? Just sit up for a bit. But as opposed to just sort of doing a lot of driver-related things that if you've got, uh, what is EVGA's system monitoring program uh precision, precision x per, thank you so if you've got precision max, holy crap my uh, brain works josh you're back where it, it was in his it's L1. like waking up he hasn't been yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so if, if you've got the precision max uh enabled on other components it will display that direct information on the keyboard which is, you know, a relatively interesting sort of thing for a keyboard to do. Uh, apart from that, it's Whoa. not so proper. Whoa, I just saw the price. Sorry, continue. Uh, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm going to get there. Uh, okay. Although, <laughs> to be honest, it's not very different from the original one. Uh, but yeah, that, that screen does cost you a little bit. And a little bit? Yeah, just a wee little bit. And, you know, the worst part about it is that the, the kale switches tend to be considered less expensive, not cheap, but less expensive. But they are less expensive and they don't quite have the same feel as cherries. Yeah. If you've ever compared them side by side. And now if you want to get even better, they're just ABS shot keycaps. <sighs> uh, there is nothing special about those keycaps whatsoever. 
However, they do sell a tool so that uh, those of you that have to can remove them and you know replace them with. I think it even comes you're... with the tool. Yes, it, it does. With the tool. They, they've so realized nice. that you know. So you can like immediately rip can... off those single shot ABS keycaps as soon as you buy this. But how much will this set Donald you back? Wait, is is that a Gom Jabbar? Almost, but not quite. Keypad. And if you, if you pull it keyboard. before it's finished, you will die. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So at least me. you'll Enough. know Enough. that you get to the price. What's nano. the price? When the original EVGA Z10 launched, it was $169. It's, it's it's come down in price to about $69. Wow, $69. This okay. brand new RGB version of it is launching at $100. And eighty bucks. Uh, I, I that don't. Screen, that U.S. Be picture of myself. Hmm? U.S. or Canadian dollars? That'd be U.S. Oh, Canadian. Yeah. You're looking more two thirty ish. Yeah, I, I just and, and in a way I'm biased because I can never picture spending that much on a keyboard ever. Not the, unless it does a lot more than type for me. It fulfills certain urges and needs and will get me a hmm. beer. Yeah. Well, okay. But apart I from that, say, it's insane. The the most expensive keyboard I ever used was this Topre Real Force keyboard from a couple of years ago now. That was like two forty nine. But those are those are crazy. It's it's like every like imaginable customization and it came with all these or it was like when the dos keyboard first came out and like the the price on those things was insane but they were also unique no one else was sort of doing that now like the 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 keyboard market the newest corsair yeah the the newest corsair k95 the the platinum xt that i reviewed a couple weeks ago that one is two hundred dollars so it's but it's everything you would ever want if you were customizing a, a like off the shelf retail keyboard. Like obviously, people who get really into keyboards, they start building their own keyboards. So follow Scott Wasson on Twitter, and you'll see all sorts of updates on his latest keyboard builds. No. And I'm hoping that if you're in just, the DSM six, this will be properly recognized as something that could be treated. Yeah, but hey, if if you haven't got the bug yet, if you aren't obsessed with making keyboards yet. That Corsair for one ninety nine, it was like this aluminum construction, and it had double shot PBD keycaps, and it's using real cherry switches, and it has every imaginable customization and extra keys, and you know, you have any idea USB pass through. Wow. But what I'm saying, like this, this has a screen on it, and because it has a screen on it, suddenly it's it's a kale. Okay, we we get requests for product reviews from like Amazon companies that are offering the latest 40 to $50 mechanical keyboard. And it's always the same. It's like the kale switch or an unnamed equivalent with single shot ABS keycaps. And they're all kind of the same. And anyhow, I, I struggle with the price, but Hey, if it goes down like the other one did, maybe it'll be $79 in a year and then it'll be mm-hmm. the budget keyboard to buy chat. And just imagine what the next zero one's gonna be like. Well, yeah, I, I want a hologram. I want a holographic like display, not an LCD. Chasp, but then zero. you only have like Princess Leia saying, "Help me, Sebastian Peak." You're That's the, fine. You're That's my fine. only hope. If it looks good, I haven't ever had a real hologram. Okay, I'm trying to say Chasp Zero upped their Patreon pledge, so I'm announcing it on the podcast. Thank you. Oh, who gave you access to that? Chasp. Oh, I, Jim and sent me you, a, a thing. It's in this. Well, I guess it's just a PM or DM or something. I don't know. I, I somehow appeared on my screen. I'm not sure where it came from. Or I we'll imagined it. it. Mm-hmm. Now, Tim. Tim Very. And honestly, I haven't heard from Tim in a while. Like, this is his return to PC Per posting things for the f- first time in hey, a few Tim. months now. The Most dark. The, the dark. You know the Chromax black stuff from Noctua? where they've done this whole blacked out, be quiet kind of look. They have a new Chrome X Black version of that well-regarded low-profile AM4 cooler, the NHL9A, the companion to the uh, L9i, which is that ubiquitous ultra-low-profile 
cooler for Intel stuff. And it's using, of course, the new SecuFirm 2 low-profile mount. This is a very simple mount, by the way, for these. It's about as simple as it gets. A lot of low-profile coolers simple mount, follow this pattern. Simple needs. But you know what is interesting about this? I don't have the specs here, but these are heavy. I have both the I and the A version. But uh, I, I, let me see if it's on here. Yeah, The weight, yeah, this 465 grams with the fan. The weight of the AM4 version is significantly more than the Intel version, at least in my experience. So it's it's a beefy cooler for 50 bucks. And when you get into that low profile world, it's, you know, you're kind of, you have to tailor your whole build around what CPU cooler is going to fit because depending on the ultra slim enclosure you've picked out, you may not be able to use a CPU over like 65 watts and with a product like now they say technically this is able to cool up to a Ryzen 7 3800X. I would personally put a 3700X in there because that's the 65 watt variant and that would make a great basis for an ultra low profile AMD build in something like a Dan cases or ultra small case like that. But anyway, in the US and Europe, it is now available MSRP 4990 and this is pretty sweet looking. If you're if you're just listening to the podcast, go to the Go to PC Per and look at this in the show notes. We have a link to the story, or just look up the Noctua NH-L9A-AM4 space Chromax dot black, and you can see pictures of this completely blacked out. Well, I know you can undervolt. Waffles in the chat is telling me to undervolt. True, true, but I mean, talking out of the box stuff. Boy, you I know would, what? The, uh, the minimalist in me is enjoying what I'm seeing here. Yes, it's quite it's, the, it's quite pretty. It's like that Model T styling. It's it's a black heat sink with black mounting hardware and a black fan and, you know, a black cable with a nice it's clean line on it. Yeah. yeah. It's just a nice low 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 profile cooler. 37 millimeters tall, which is pretty much ideal for those like AM4 like the what is the Dan case is the uh, I can't remember the name of it A4 SFX or something. Moving on to the next item on our list, Jeremy wrote something about Nintendo digital pre-orders. What is this? Uh, I believe in the bird world, it's called a dick move. Okay, so this is this battle has already been lost in the U.S. Uh, where essentially when you're buying something from Nintendo digitally, be it an actual piece of hardware from them or a game, the, if something bad happens or if you change your mind, you're, you're not allowed to, you're, you're not given a grace period in which to cancel your order. And so this is different. And still speaking about the US, which is the older ruling. This is, this is the rule, older ruling. This is very different from any of the other companies which tend to do that, uh, especially when, you know, you've pre-ordered it because you're that type of person, uh, no judgment much, uh, that pre-ordered it two years before the damn thing was going to come out. And along the way, you find out that, you know, horrible things have happened and what's actually going to be released is not anywhere near as nice as what's going to arrive. Uh, any other company usually lets you cancel it. Uh, like maybe not Atari and their VCS. I think you still have to pay for that. It's March, they're saying now. Uh, but in the EU, which generally doesn't tend to allow this kind of crap to go on, they've been in court since 2018, and there was a judgment earlier this week where it was ruled that, yes, even under the EU's Consumer Rights Directive, they're just allowed to say no. The second that you hit uh, order on the cart, that's it. That's their money. You're never going to see it back. I, I don't get that in this day and age where almost anything you do, you, you're given a little bit of leeway because, you know, your child got a hold of it and started ordering stuff. Or like, like my example earlier where you for whatever reason, pre-order two hour years before it's going to come out and suddenly find out that what you were promised doesn't exist, but you're still on the hook for it and there's nothing you can damn well do. 
And I just, it's the kind of stuff that, you know, annoys me. It, it's not right. And th- there could be an argument that if everyone does it, then, well, Nintendo, why wouldn't you want to be the odd ones out and actually be the cooler company? But in this case, you're the one specifically choosing to be the worst. I don't get it, but uh, on the plus side, you know, their, their accountants are going to love it. I'm still bitter about a 3DS that I sold and then afterwards realized, oh, the digital stuff I bought was linked to that specific handheld console. No refunds. And no unlike, refunds. No refunds. And unlike Sony, where you buy a digital title with your Sony account and you, like back in the day when I was like doing this on my PS3 and had a, a PSP or a Vita, then like a lot of the PlayStation 1 classics, for example, I was collecting those. And then I could play them on either console, the handheld or the, the the PS3. And then if I got a new PS3, I just signed in with my account, redownloaded them or used a backup. Same with the handheld. I could have the same game installed on a PSP, a Vita, my PS3. If it was compatible, my PS4 later on down the road. It's just, it it's... It's a game that you own. It's like uh, the app no, you store. Don't. If I buy an Android app, no, you, you just license well, the ability I'm to use it. it. Right. So, but I mean, at least it's more convenient for me to license like an Android app or an iOS app because if I get a new iPhone or a new iPad or something, I just log in uh, and I can just, go to my previously purchased apps and have it again. If I but buy Nintendo something, I feel like I should own it. Uh, and, and, That's why you got to uh, buy the physical thing. Oh, uh, well, let me introduce you to DRM and uh, the right to repair and how that's well true. that's right. been working lately, too. Um, uh, yeah, this is getting yeah. really negative, and I don't want to talk about it anymore. We're all in the weeds It's not my now. fault. I didn't put this one on. Okay. What's well, next? Hey, Tim. Tim. I could bitch about, about this for a long time. Okay. Do you remember a couple years ago at CES? It was CES 2018. Asus at their suite. They had this bezel-free Free betel nuts? Yeah, it's it's this thing with optical, what do they call it? Optical channels. And it it literally blends two monitors side by side into each other over the bezel so it looks kind of like there's no bezel. And actually in person it works. It sort of not quite smears, but it sort of has this this interesting kind of like a mirror. I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of like you're just reflecting one half to the other half and it blends. It's, it's called refraction. Yes. Okay. And, and I still, I, it, the video that they play makes me think that, yeah, it looks really good in perfect setup conditions, but I don't know. You move your head around. You are going to see. Yeah. It's yeah, gonna the image not being perfect. Now, if you're if you're sitting stock center, that's fine. You move and shift, you will see a shift in, in the line just because and that's it will physics. Not match because yeah. both sides will shift differently and it will make things interesting. I think the idea uh, is not just horribly, you're sitting so. there staring at the center monitor and you're getting like these immersive effects from the side monitors, maybe. I really well, think I am right now that. Ultra wide monitors to me, and it's been a couple of years since they first showed this. The announcement is that it's now available. It's the bezel free kit ABF01, and it's $109. But I, I'm thinking at this point, and they're expensive. So if you already have monitors that you don't want to give up, this is a way to sort of simulate having an ultra wide, just one of those giant three foot wide ultra wide gaming monitors on your desk. But I feel like those, and Asus has their own. Like we were looking at these massive like 36 or 38 inch monitors and they're they go Let's bigger talk than this about now, those 49 but... inch monitors yeah yeah the, the ultra, ultra really wide. really big ultra yeah. wide curved monitors i think have kind of but i mean compare the cost of one of those at a nice high resolution to this at 109 dollars for a monitors you already own yeah. that could be appealing i you'd have to see it though well and i i'll never be able to because I've been rocking three 24-inch 1080s for years now, uh, depending on how I feel like when I'm doing being productive like this. They're in portrait mode. Otherwise, I'll swap them over to landscape occasionally. But then maybe I these should are sp- get Asus to send these to you so that you can see if you're converted. Well, I mean, these are Asus monitors, monitors I'm using. Hey, there you go. But there's this problem. They've what? got fat bottoms. 
that they're old enough that they've got a rounded back. And so part, specifically they got a little junk in that, the trunk is what you're saying. Yeah, this is only for the flat panel designs where you don't have a bulge at the front or the back. They, Wait a minute, hold on a second. You're talking about a big bottom, now you're talking about a bulge. Are we well, still talking about in the front. monitors here? Uh, yes. You know what they say, the bigger the cushion, the sweeter the pushing. Yes. Well, That's there's always a first for me. Thank you, Sebastian. The looser the waistband, the deeper the quicksand. Or so I've read. Uh, it's a new one on me. I like it. Well, this is you haven't seen Spinal Tap. The the yeah, richer no, the I, pudding. I just utterly forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> See, Josh knows where I'm going here. Anyway, yeah. All right, and moving on to our to final watch. story. Our final story, if I can find it. Uh, this has Jeremy written all over it because I I can't even interpret what the title means. Zen spelled with an X, and the art of the Source Engine modeling. Question mark. Question mark. Question. There is no the. Oh, I, I added that. Right, it's Zen and the Wait, art there is of a the. motorcycle it's Zen maintenance. Zen and the art of yes, I have actually Zen and the art of bicycle maintenance, but uh, that's that's the knockoff version. But Zen, if okay. you remember Half Life, is where the game gets a little bit different. After you've taken on, uh, you know, you've you've escaped from the lab, the labor, yeah, the laboratory and have taken on some weird flying head things and jumped into a giant portal and the game gets much weirder. Now, Black Mesa went and redid Half-Life, the original, in the Source engine. And it's utterly gorgeous. And they've been working on it for a very long time now. But the original way that they went, went right up to the point where you jump into the portal and go off to Zen. And if you've played it, there's obvious reasons for that because holy crap, that's still going to be a lot of work with a source engine where you've got, I, if you remember, like, that was a tech demo for HDR back in the day, was what the source engine did. And Zen is pretty much all just HDR and tentacle or, well, testicle monsters, to be honest. It's been a labor of love and they've done a gorgeous it's job be on because it. Because that was the part that I stopped in the original Half-Life when I first got it. It's like, screw it, this, Zen is not fun. Well, it turned into a whole new game. And yeah. quite frustrating, but me and a buddy did eventually beat it. Because part of it was, it's just pretty. And it was pretty back then, it's just it wouldn't be pretty anymore. But now it is. So any second now, any day, we're going to be seeing uh, the release of Black Mesa 1.0. If you own Black Mesa already, uh, what you're going to get is, yes, testicle monster. It, what you're going to get is all of this new stuff. Plus, they've gone back and redone some of the AI to make the original ones better. Uh, so that the original missions, you know, the, the mercenaries you're fighting are going to be even brighter and more effective at killing you, which is kind of terrifying. You're, in a way you're saying they're in HDR, they're going to be brighter? Well, this, uh, too. Brighter, literally, richer, and figuratively. Richer, more colors. Yes. So, yeah, if you own it already, you'll be getting this for free. If you don't, it's usually about 20 bucks, 18 bucks. If you have no idea what the Half-Life series is, well, it's free on Steam to play until Half-Life Alex comes out. So just try it. You will experience something that is amazing because it's still one of the best and it, yeah, it depended on scripting fairly heavily, but it still remains one of the best first-person shooters that has ever been made, in my opinion. It, it was just amazing. It did things we'd never seen before. So, you know... You could break apart now, crates. You could. It was so much better right, than let's... Trespasser. <laughs> Isn't my dental appointment this games... morning was better than Trespasser. All right, uh, picks of the week. And Josh, you are first on our list. I am. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, man. You know, I, I bought this last couple of days ago, and it was 209 And now they dropped down $5 more. It's the 
3600 X. It can go into that stinking oh, nice gigabyte Aorus uh, X570 Elite board, and you'd be happy for years and years to come. 205 bucks. Plus, you get the three months of Xbox uh, game. Whatchamacallit? Pass. What is that damn thing? Game yeah. pass. Yeah. Or a copy of Borderlands 3 or The Outer Worlds. And I'm I'm nice. I'm gonna be choosing the Outer Worlds for myself. That's fun. You'll like it. Yeah. Two hundred and thirty six hundred X for basically the for basically this, the launch price of the thirty six hundred. So you're getting all that <laughs> yeah. overclocked goodness yeah. right out of the box. Yeah. 4.4 gigahertz max boost. Wow. It's going to be that? quick. 12 threads. And That's all crazy. that L3 this cache. 32 megs. <sighs> Jeremy, what is this? What is this YouTube link? Oh, sir. This is what Maury found earlier this week that is just okay. too brilliant not to give up. So he, oh, Nari, this thing, yeah, yeah. You yeah. may know uh from power supply reviews, motherboard reviews, that sort of thing. Found this video where a guy takes a three hundred dollar Walmart laptop, <laughs> takes it apart, puts in a Thunderbolt PCIe bridge, attaches a Fitter X five ninety to it, and away it goes. Now, fair warning, he only gets PCIe 2.0 or 2X on it, but still, I don't okay. care. This is just amusing as hell. I love it. It'll teach you a lot about how to screw around with a laptop and how things work. Right? It's also a learning experience for dirt cheap, as he says, brand new $300 <laughs> $300 laptop. I love seeing the ribbon cable, the 16 you know, lane ribbon cable adapted to. Yeah. The four lane M.2 cable, which of course is then only connecting it to two lanes. Yes, but still, I'm, I'm sorry. It is just amazing. I love this. It's the first time I've run into this lanes, guy. I hope he does well. Yeah, I don't yeah, care. It's, <laughs> but I'm saying even two lanes is still better than any of the mobile GPUs that are probably going to be in any oh, laptop yeah. under $1,000. So, wow. Okay. I mean, it. I, I've actually wondered about this and then the, the lane limitation always like as you can buy M.2 adapters like this became fa fairly common during the height of the mining craze. Mm -hmm. so you can buy any kind of riser adapter cheap now. Oh, yeah. On Amazon, they're really cheap anytime I've looked and I've thought about trying to make something like this, especially because if I ever want to do another thin mini ICX type project, none of these have expansion slots back in the like the Z. 87 era there was one asus board that had a by four slot which you could put a 90 degree adapter on and, and install like a sound card or something yeah. but uh those days are gone that's cool uh my pick what was it oh yeah uh just because i was retesting uh coolers i went back and retested the hyper 212 black edition now i have the rgb black edition and the one that i i'm referencing here is the ten dollar cheaper non-rgb version uh, and i've not tested it i assume the performance is the same it has the same heat sink this is a fantastic cooler for the money and i know there are a lot of stalwarts who like absolutely consider the hyper 212 evo to be the best low-cost cooler of all time honestly the eh, black edition is better run out in, too. it's it's better in every way the mounting mechanism was fixed. It's not that flimsy X-shaped spring-loaded thing anymore. And you get a lot tighter connection to the CPU. Thermals are better. And noise is much lower. The 212 Evo was always very effective, but it was always like a mid-40s decibel kind of cooler. And you get down into the 30s with this thing, depending on your fan profile. And I don't think it ever even hit 40 in my testing. So it's it's very quiet. And... It's $35 and a far more premium product and a far better looking product, if that matters, than the 212 Evo. So if you are looking for that budget cooler and there's a lot of stuff out there, $35. This is the sweet spot as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, we're not sponsored by them or anything. I have no deals with Cooler Master, but 
it's hard to beat at this price level. You've got to spend a lot more. You've got to spend like twice this much to get into that like be quiet, dark rock world where you're getting a quieter solution that actually cools better. How how does it compare to like the AMD Wraith Spire that comes with my 3600X? Those are pretty quiet. I actually quieter, some, I think. Yeah, serious testing on those, but I mean, those are a dual heat pipe solution. We should have talked about this. Of course, in the last week or two, there was news about a, a four heat pipe variant of the Wraith cooler coming out from AMD. Ooh. And then no, AMD six. decried this and said those are, yeah. oh, was it six? Yeah. They said those were fake. And not to use them if you find them, they're counterfeit. So now this the, the race the fire that comes with mine is too. is that the step below, not the, the RGB or race. Oh, okay. Yeah, another prism, they call it. Yeah, yeah. The race prism is the is the big one. This would be know. considerably better than that, because oh, you've got no four direct contact heat pipes. They've they've did a better job, I think, with this one as far as milling the base. You get really good contact. I don't know. It's just, it's a great cooler. So it's going to be a lot better than one of my old Intel uh, in the box coolers. Oh, Lord. Just a bit. With the push just, pins. I hate yeah. the push oh, pins. Oh, yeah. Because you, you can never get it. And then you push down on one of them and finally gets it to lock. And then the whole thing is like, uh, it's coming up on the other side. You try to push it down. Yeah. And it pops the other one back out again. I hate it's, it. I hate those. Things. Worst design I don't say ever. hate very often. I hate those. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's it. Um, by the way, I added uh, some words of wisdom to the end of the show notes this week, which I just found this hilarious for whatever reason that I'm not even gonna get into. I was researching the history of Intel Nook mini PCs, which you know, the, the big launch was 2014, and that was when I started here at PC Per. And I was doing mini PC reviews right away. My first was the ECS Leva, the first generation Leva. Which I still have. Actually, the reason is, long story short, uh, a leaking basement window and a shelf full of old stuff getting wet later. I was going through these mini PCs and trying to save them and taking them apart and cleaning the insides with alcohol. And uh, they all work, including that original Leva. But Intel... High five, good story. Thank you. Intel, uh, I was I thought you were gonna like the David Tell, like, does that story come in either short or interesting? But the Intel's words of wisdom back when the Nook launched, and I had to find this on the internet archive. For some reason they don't have this up anymore. Quote, anything your tower PC can do, the Intel Nook can do, and in four inches of real estate. End quote. Intel 2014. I find that to so be. So you're saying little... it's not the size of the nook; it's the motion. <laughs> apparently, I mean, if you shake the nook vigorously enough, apparently it can play AAA games at high resolutions at acceptable frame rates, even back in 2014. So I'm guessing maybe it can't do everything your tower PC can do, but it can do anything that your tower PC can do. Or that was ridiculous, and that's why they took it down. So anyway, words of wisdom from Intel in 2014 during the absolute pinnacle of the next unit of computing uh, hype. And of course, now we're getting closer to that because now the new Nook stuff, the ultimate Nook stuff, well, you actually can plop a GPU in there, and that's how they can make it a true desktop tower replacement. Anyway, that's uh, all we had this week, I think. Uh, thanks for listening and or watching. And we will be back next week with another one of these things. Bye. I think it's going to be a long, long time. Till touch town, bring me around again and fine. I'm not the man they think I am. Burning out his fuse out here alone.